good. So uh, last time we uh, uh, talked about uh, different hype for different technologies, especially all of them somehow related maybe to the data science. And we want to see whether data science was a, is a hype itself. Or and we have mentioned some of these examples that you can see it, uh, here, for example, for different technologies, etc. But uh, the question is that, I mean, uh, data science and machine learning are, nowadays are the same in a sense that, I mean, we talk, now we talk about AI, everyone talks about AI. But AI is nothing more than that actually machine learning. And machine learning is actually part of data science. But we are talking about the data science. And you see, we didn't, I mean, maybe the name changed, but we knew that they, they are using different names for data science anyhow, big data, data analysis, or something like this. Like ChatGPT, like uh, 2023. Talk with some of them, they believe that actually you may, maybe such a thing in 2016, not 2023. And frankly speaking, any time that I'm working, I call it actually a creature. <laughs> I, any time that I'm working with it, I become more excited. <laughs> because it's doing something amazing. Like it understands the thing. And if you remember, I mean, there was a, some, and another thing which is important in data science. If you work on data science, this is essentially means tech. And generally you should read the news, et cetera. That is important because it gives you some ideas of what's going on. You cannot just, essentially shut off all the media, et cetera, and say, oh, it's working with data science. No, it's not the case. It, data, these are all part of the data science. And it shows that nothing is nothing was hype, even actually was the reverse of hype. The progress that we expected was much less than the progress that we had it. Happens very rarely, I would say, but it happens. So, uh, and uh, not only that, but, uh, we are getting actually this type of things in this technology revolution, uh, revolution, revolutionizes essentially this natural language processing, which is essentially chat GPT. And beyond that, essentially, now you can do lots of things in education, food supply, disease uh, epidemics. And one idea that the people are using it is that uh, the, generally, it has been like that. The NLP was somehow the test bed or the front uh, battlefield of I mean, essentially progress. The people had some progress at NLP. Generally, then other fields, they try to make those things as some kind of token as a text and then represent that one as a text and something that worked for the text can work, I feel, well for the other things. So they are using this technology, and this is the thing that you will see that essentially. Uh, this again, they will call it AI hype now. Everything is going up essentially, especially AI based. AI based startups, and even in this tight market. And this is different actually uh, from something that we have done it with other things like uh, the people have done it, I mean, before with the big data or like they work with the data. As a statistician, they are working uh, essentially on data for a long time. But the thing that we have it here are quite different the, from the, the technology that we have here is quite different from the one that we have here. Uh, why be different? Uh, so it was not a hype, definitely. And even it was, again, somehow we had more progress than the one that we expected. Nobody believed that we can have chat GPT essentially less than a year, like last year. I didn't believe it, and I've seen lots of people been more expert in the field they didn't have this. Uh, so uh, why is it different now, essentially comparing to before? The main thing is that we have, I mean, lots of uh, data that are digitally available. Even Chat GPT, the main thing is that there are, you can actually, everyone can do that if you have resources. There are 400, uh, I think, terabyte of data that is the whole web essentially. But you can actually download it. It is freely available. But of course, you should have the resources to save it and then process it. That may be essentially millions of dollars that you need to pay essentially. I think some early version of Chat GPT, I mean, it was like 
4 million just was the compute cost to do that. So not everyone has that money essentially. But if you have it that is available and it was not like that before. And uh, uh, this uh, essentially, so that was this digitally available things. Plus this kind of uh, inexpensive computing uh, plus cloud in particular. So cloud computing made lots of things much easier, essentially. You don't need to have all these resources yourself. You don't need to buy all this stuff. You can use one of these uh, top companies, essentially, the cloud cloud business, it is AWS, Amazon, AWS, Azure from Microsoft, and G Cloud from Google. And of course, there are something like Digital Oceans or others. If you just want to run the server, that's a good one. But this, Three ones, generally they are giving very advanced technology to handle that. And not only that, there are two other companies, uh, these two other company, Databricks and Snowflake. These are the things that also they are providing even more techniques essentially uh, on top of these clouds to do that. And of course, there's the competition between cloud and this, but if you pay them, I mean, then you can do a lot of things with shit on the cloud. You don't need to buy them, you can rent it and do that. So this somehow cloud plus computing, uh, because now you can rent it, it becomes much easier. So you can essentially much easier to analyze it. We have more data, we have ways to do it, uh, essentially to analyze them much easier. Uh, and also, I mean, the way that we are thinking about the problems are different from the way that we had it before. Uh, this is essentially, I will say due to the, uh, rise of essentially some algorithms, for example, streaming algorithms. Uh, plus uh, something like called uh, MPC or massively parallel computational. So this is massively parallel computational algorithm. These are the two set of data that we have also, and uh, they are providing, so these are some specially designed approaches or algorithms that they can handle this big data. For instance, we have more data, we didn't have it. Then we have compute power to compute them. And not only that, we have even more advanced algorithm, especially designed for it. Uh, and this streaming algorithm generally is that those data that they are coming, you don't have the space essentially to save them and you need to just have some sketch out of it and make a sense of it. In the MPC, you have the data, but this data is distributed over things, and you are doing some parallel computation at the same time, and then they can pass to each other. In particular, Spark is a good example of that, or there is a Hadoop or MapReduce, Flume, but Spark is the main famous one that I think you should know about it, about the distributed parallel computations. As a result of these three things happening at the same time, but there, uh, essentially uh, more data available, huge data available, uh, more essentially compute power, and especially design algorithm that they can handle these things. So now we can analyze much more and we can have something like that. Again, I mean, continuing essentially about this one, this is from uh, Rise of uh, Big Data. There are some uh, key changes that we have it here when we consider this big data. So comparing also the thing that the statistician considered for the data set, because they were always considering like all this type of data that you are sampling, they were there. This algorithm that we have, as I mentioned, for a streaming algorithm and PC, that's actually much more generalization of those algorithms. Uh, so uh, the one big difference essentially here is that uh, before, when the statisticians they try to work on the data, they were working on a small, carefully collected random sample, very clean data. They had very curated, clean, and a small sample. Here, it is not the um, that, and part of this cloud computing that they have mentioned, compute power, is actually the power of GPUs. Again, the first successful example of them was uh, for this NLPs. That was for a speech to text, uh, uh, essentially, or a speech understanding uh, uh, natural language processing application. That was back, I think, 2005, 2007, 8, essentially. Shows that if you have enough GPUs, 
graphics card essentially can be used to run this kind of deep nets. These are part of the algorithms also designed for this purpose. They were this algorithm were before also, but now due to compute power, you could actually run them and you could actually run them in a distributed way. So in that sense also, they were somehow related to this, especially about this kind of um, map reduce and uh, other sort of algorithm. You could run it, this kind of learning in a distributed way. And as a result, uh, so before we said, that, okay, you need to do the work yourself. You should try to find clean data. You should try to run them essentially. But uh, nowadays, it is not like that. And uh, uh, you don't need to do all of them. You just get this kind of large uncurated messy data sets to these models and you don't need to understand it or make sense of it. You will give it this model, clean everything and make understand. The example, as I mentioned, the best example is ChatGPT that you are giving the whole world by web. It understands what you should do that. And one of the things that it learns is that you give a sentence to essentially optimize it for you. Somehow you optimize over your limited knowledge that you have in your brain. That optimizes over the whole world of sentences and gives much better solution. Much better, essentially, written. So that's, uh, I mean, uh, they're like in a set, before it was very costly. Now, I mean, you don't think about it, you just give it to the data, the machine makes sense. And again, this partly was also about the deep nets, deep networks, deep learning, but that was there before. But this compute power it was the one, plus this special algorithm that you can do it in a distributed way that made it possible that we can do this. Of course, then they are more advanced version of uh, deep neural nets. As the uh, other things that we are, again, somehow related to this one that uh, currently we are considering essentially, at least until recently, we were considering more about the correlation versus causation. And what is the causation? The causation is that, I mean, what caused what? <clears throat> Let me give you an example. So for example, today is warm. It causes that I have an ice cream. It may cause that also I go to the pool. It means that the fact that I have an ice cream and I went to the pool, these are somehow correlated. So correlated means essentially this relation, I mean, this is somehow in terms of probability, if this happens, the chance that these other things happen, also it changes. They are not independent even. We will talk about the probability stuff in the class as well. But uh, in particular, you can go to my introduction to algorithms course at YouTube, and we talk about probability there. So if you want to know more about it, we have a crash course there. But we talk about it in this class. But it would be good if you have a good knowledge about it. So uh, this causation is a very complicated thing, this causality. And uh, I mean, there are lots of papers on that. And one important thing about correlation is that the correlation is a symmetric thing. If this is co correlated with this, A is correlated with B, B is correlated with C. However, this is not the case for causation. For example, a disease may cause headache, but the headache does not mean that cause that disease. This asymmetry also makes it quite complicated. However, uh, so before when statisticians, they are considering all this data, they try to, to in, uh, like do the inference, they try to understand this causation by hand. And again, it's hard. Machine can understand it in a very complicated, uh, like in a com using complicated uh, computations, but for us, it's very hard to do it manually. Uh, today, we essentially give up on causation. We say, okay, I don't care what caused what. As long as there is correlation and you can find uh, this correlation essentially is enough for me to do the predictions. And uh, that's the way that we are doing. I mean, and more recently, causation also became a big thing. So I heard this one, for example, at Google or at Uber or other places that they care about the causation, uh, but not for learning. 
that much maybe. Now they are they are doing, for example, A-B testing. When you do A-B testing, this is again, very important things uh, uh, talk about it briefly before, that when you do A-B testing, you have say two websites, you create a new website and you want to see whether this website is better than the other. Then uh, this is the thing that the causality is very, becomes very important in this A-B testing. And why do we know that? Do that. For example, Chase creates a new website. And then the question of whether it is better than previous one or not. Uh, there are several factors that you need to be careful about it here. And this A-B testing is very important in all data science. Uh, so one important thing is the bias. For example, if I use this Chase for, I don't know, 10 years, if tomorrow it changes its appearance, I will not be happy with it. So if they run it for two weeks or something, because I knew everything before, what was the place of this bottom, etc. Now they changed. So this is called something bias that we should try to avoid it. Uh, and how can we, for example, avoid bias is that if you want to send the traffic, generally they send like the traffic of the users, 100%, they send a small amount here, such as they can. It should be not very small, such as it makes sense, uh, but it should be not too much because they may lose lots of customers, especially like, for example, advertisement work can cost them potentially millions if it's not a good website. Uh, but the catch is that uh, you have a new web, uh, new website to remove bias, for example, is one approach is that you should consider only new users and send it either to your old website or new. Website. In this case, you don't have a bias because this person didn't use any of them. So there's no bias toward the old one. And then you can get it. But then this is a part that causation actually happens a lot. It's kind of, this is called A-B testing essentially. And you need to consider bias. Bias is part of also somehow very related to this causation essentially. So in some sense that you want to see that the people are like the old things before, you need to see what is the reason, what caused that. It was it because of a bias or was because of something that this website is not good. And this is important. If you are not doing it correctly, that might be because this cause because of the bias. And of course, this is not a good uh, uh, result that you want to get it because it might be wrong, essentially. Maybe it's a good website, but you should just allow time such as old users are to get used. So causation is important. And actually these are the top companies that are still coming back to this to understand this. And this is actually a field. So you can causality and others. There are lots of papers on it and it's a complicated field. As I mentioned, uh, lots of things that we know, for example, that we don't have this kind of symmetry of uh, correlation. And this is asymmetric. Anyhow, you can uh, read more about causality. And it's an important one, actually, if you read it. Uh, we are not talking that much in the class, but in some future courses you may have it. But of course, you can read it and learn more about it. And of course, you can use ChatGPT as well to learn more about it. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned, at least for learning, now lots of the times are coming up through correlation, and that is easier essentially to handle, to understand, or like less complicated somehow. Uh, and finally, I mean, uh, there is another difference that we have, it is, as I mentioned, this datafication that we have mentioned, like, for example, for advertisement, that they, they, this company, they are trying to essentially uh, creating avatar of you. Like, if you have a sensor, like, in your the place that you are sitting, they try to essentially find the avatar of you using this sensor. If you are using, for example, to Facebook and you do like, from this like, you try to essentially create uh, person like you. And then this is the, this kind of, some of this, they have this multimodal type of thing that from the sensor and from this can be combined it and get a better. The same thing that nowadays they are doing essentially for image and text together. So you are not only getting something for the text, but can be combined text and image and you can get a question. For example, you may ask a question from ChatGPT about a particular image. Then you bring an image which is in that respect is similar to the image that I'm giving you. And uh, yes, so these are all, I mean, some of these important things that uh, essentially is different now versus before. And as uh, we discussed essentially, 
these factors that we have it more. And this is the thing, as I mentioned, already showed that it is not a hype. That's the thing. But these are some important uh, key factors that made this possible. Maybe this datafication was not there before as well. And again, part of it, again, because of we have now better streaming algorithm, for example, here, that they can get this data and then put uh, in a just process them and make this avatar from you. And also, we have lots of compute power that we can do. Compute power generally means space, for example. YouTube, I mean, there was not that much space in it before. Uh, so this is uh, something from Halvari, and he was a, uh, I think uh, still he's a chief economist at Google, and he was a professor at Berkeley. He said that the ability to take data, to be able to understand it, to process it, and to extract value from it, to visualize it, and to communicate it, uh, that's something that should be hugely important a skill in the next decade, not only at the professional level, but even for educational level, for elementary school kids, for high school kids, and for college kids. And again, this is nothing, uh, I mean, new. Nowadays, you are reading all this uh, news again that how at a school, elementary school even, uh, the teacher can prevent cheating through chat GPT because like I have a son, it was like last year it was fourth grade. And then one of the things that write an arguative story, argument that why this is good versus no give this thing to ChatGPT is the best thing essentially for writing a very convincing thing. And of course, that is the danger as well because it can actually use this one to now you can use it to convince you that you should vote for this particular person or you vote for this particular uh, law or something like this. It can be very dangerous, of course. But uh, again, this is some of the things that already essentially is in there. We are not talking about uh, like, uh, essentially future. Already such a thing is so important even for school kids, not even high school for elementary school. Uh, so, and these are, by the way, these things that we are talking about to understand the data, to process it, to extract value out of it. And uh, so this extract value generally means essentially ML part. And then visual it or communicate it, all of this, that these are the things that we are considering in this course. So these are, we are mentioning essentially the different aspects of this course that you are seeing. That's the whole idea of this principles of data science. Uh, good, so let me uh, just, uh, recording. Um, great. And so, this is the thing that we talked about this one. What the data science should uh, data scientists should know? I mean, this is again some map that we will talk more about it. This is a visualization. So in some sense, we are talking about data science aspects inside the course as well. So this is some kind of called metro map or subway map that you can actually represent to communicate or visualize the data. For example, I mean, it's talking here. I mean, this is, uh, I think this is from this resource. But it's talking about that a data scientist should know about fundamentals like uh, uh, linear algebra, hash functions, uh, relational databases, et cetera. And you can read it. I will put the slides there so you can read the things there. But then you will learn all of them then when you know all of this, then you need to know about a statistics. So you will, uh, some of this essentially um, basics of a statistics. At the same time, you need to know programming. Then you can combine programming with the kind of knowledge that you have such that you can do machine learning. Machine learning essentially is a combination of when you have enough statistics and essentially programming, then you can do that. And then, uh, I mean, when you do machine learning until you will reach essentially, in particular for NLPs, uh, text mining. This is like, again, NLP, as I mentioned, natural language processing is somehow the test bed for lots of technologies that we have it here. Uh, and then when you have this one, then we are talking about visualization. Visual, visualization is something that is maybe is independent. You need to talk about the, uh, what is a tree and tree map? What are essentially this kind of subway map, et cetera, that we will talk about. These are also the things that we will talk about them in the class. 
then you may need to know seven about big data. Like what are the things that you can do it, like Hadoop or Spark that I have men mentioned, essentially. Uh, these are some other things that you should know about it. And then other things that you may know, you should know about it, about data ingestion. Uh, I mean, how can you do data discovery? How, um, I mean, you can do data integration or data uh, monging or data clearing, essentially. Filling some missed data, essentially. And this is like some kind of like toolboxes that you may have. You may need to use uh, Python, you may need to Java, or maybe you need to know a Spark and other. These are some of the tools. Again, this is something that you should know about. These are some aspects of it. And I'm just saying essentially, this is a still we are in the intro part. And I'm trying to give you this view of the thing that we are talking in this class and in general, what is the data science from different views and from different sources, essentially, such that you have a good idea about this class. And what is the thing that is needed in this program? Uh, I mean, essentially, this is uh, how to hire a data scientist. Again, the same thing that we talked. You need to know about data grappling or wrangling a skill, how to move data around and manipulate them, which generally means some scripting language like Python, Ruby, uh, or you need to especially like, uh, some uh, essentially different type of databases, relational databases or key value uh, databases essentially. Uh, like uh, uh, there are things that we will talk about it like uh, uh, and different names and we will go uh, through them, like Cassandra and other things essentially. Uh, SQL, NoSQL and like big table. Uh, BigQuery, etc. Uh, this is uh, that's something you need to know that you need to know about some programming framework like SQL. Essentially, SQL is back essentially because of this becomes again important. Or something like Hadoop or Spark. These are like how you can do it in a distributed way. Your data is in different computers. How you can do it? You cannot just bring everything on one computer. Or you have a different data with how you can do this. Uh, this is data visualization how you should essentially visualize the data. For example, you may use DS, uh, D3, JS, or there are lots of new things, like Matplot, for example, at um, Python that you may do it. And that changes from year to year. We may say something next year is a different thing. Uh, and they go going very fast, essentially. And more importantly, actually, not only what are the tools that you are using to draw, what you should draw. For example, here, as we have seen, we have this kind of uh, uh, top day map to show what a data scientist should know. The way that they put it, that's a nice way to put it to present it. Where should I use this type of thing? We will talk about that actually in this class. You need to, of course, know about the knowledge of statistics, error bar, confidence level, or so. everything now is available. Maybe before it was just R or MATLAB, but now everything, every package is almost available in uh, Python, but you should know which one you should use. Uh, like there are, this, we will talk about them essentially later. Uh, you should know about, um, about essentially forecasting or prediction that generally means uh, micro, uh, machine learning. And these are like, so like back in 2017, TensorFlow was a very important one. Now essentially there are uh, PyCharm uh, or uh, PyTorch actually by Facebook and others. And again, there are so many of them, I may forget some of them. <laughs> and I need to just search and name that. that. I have some actually uh, email to myself that I'm, any important thing I will write it down because I cannot remember. Um, I use it even, but I forget essentially sometimes. There are, there are too many of them. And of course, these are the great uh, communication skills that part of it is visualization, but part of it essentially how you should write the doc, et cetera. That's the thing that I mentioned, for example, it would be good that you will learn LaTeX because if you want to use any, uh, if you want to write something for others to use it, one of the best software is essentially Especially in tech companies, it is like LaTeX. You can do it for any technical stuff. If you want to present it, you should not use LaTeX. You should use PowerPoint. Because PowerPoint by design does not have, I mean, 
that much formula. You can still write LaTeX, but you should not write it because the people don't get it. So even the way that you communicate is important at different level. It is, it is some kind of presentation, oral presentation, or it is some kind of uh, written presentation. These are, again, the things that we are talking about this, all in this course. Uh, data life cycle. So uh, generally, this is the, I mean, short things about data life cycle, that any data that we have it, we have a data collection. First, you need to collect the data from some source. You need to do some, this is the things here. You need to do process this data. You may need to do kind of, uh, exploratory analysis and data visualization. This is before anything. You just want to see whether there's a the noise in the data or, or what is the average of the data. These are some of the things that you are doing. For example, in uh, uh, Python, pandas, you are using a lot of these things that you can. How many of you used pandas before? Okay, so that is good actually. The number increased year to year. Uh, so then, uh, then you may want to use some kind of uh, analysis on that, testing it. These are like more machine learning type of things that you will learn. But you will have some initial ideas about the data. And then from this, you go and you get some insights in policy, some decisions. And of course, you may come back to any previous things. You may go and change the analysis. You may go actually say that the data that they have collected was not a good data. It was a biased data. Uh, so this is essentially data life cycle. We will talk about the tools again for this one, uh, a different aspect of the course that we have. Uh, and again, this one, maybe this was also formal, but there are the tools are coming. For example, this, as I mentioned, this uh, Amazon AutoGluon or AutoML that I mentioned. Lots of these things, you don't need to do it now by hand. You will just give the data and it finds the best model. It tries to run different models and get the thing. So it, it's not something written in a stone. <laughs> this is the current things. Next year, it may change. Some of this may be more mechanical. As I mentioned, the whole idea here is that do it less with the brain. Uh, if the machine can do it, then machine can do it. So give it to machine and essentially do that one. And uh, this is again, for example, uh, um, some of these things that you will see even that uh, this uh, dolly or other things that you can generate images. You will explain something and generate something. So here you can, I mean, this is, I mean, maybe we have it even sooner that you can think next year. I mean, you said, okay, this is the whole data that I have. <clears throat> I want this, da this data. Go and run some machine learning, get this aspect from me. Show whether it is biased or not. <clears throat> Can you change this one and learn this thing? You just describe this. So you don't need to actually do as a thing in data science. So you just describe what you want and it goes there and automatically, because now you have all the technology, you only need to put the pipeline of them. ChatGPT understands almost everything. So if you understand it, then you can do that. And then <clears throat> if you understand something, this is, there are some, uh, again, <clears throat> Watch the latest, uh, this potentials of e-commerce that we had it, I think seven and eight, especially. We talk about lots of technology that we are doing chat GPT. So now you want to go to the trip. Before you say, okay, you should search there, find the trip. No, I mean, you just go, it knows what are the steps. It goes for each of them, it's doing the right thing. and say, this is the best trip that I can find it. This is the hotel, this is the things. You just describe your things because it, the computer can understand it. Then the rest is just set of action. We talk about several software like this that they are they already existed actually. Several of them are open source in the potential of e-commerce. Uh, seven or eight. Yeah, like seven and eight. So again, this is some view. It changes over time. And lots of them may be not that much relevant in the future because all of them will be automated. Uh, this will be done. In some sense, like for example, consider TensorFlow. TensorFlow is something for machine learning, but you need to say which model I want to use it, etc. PyTorch made it much easier. Lots of parameters you don't need to do that. Uh, Amazon AutoGluon have done even more than that. It's just that you will just give the data. You see that there are some filling, filling the data for me. So what is the machine learning? You have some data. You want to say based on this data, there are some missing data that I don't know what will happen. Just fill in those data. You will give an Excel things to the Excel sheet essentially to the computer and say that fill in for me. 
or a table you will give it and say filling those missing values. That's essentially the whole idea of ML, that you are filling some, you will learn from some things that we know the value to filling the rest. Okay, so very well for you. And then again, all of this you may just communicate and say this, do this one, this one, all of them is automated. We are going that way. A typical data science uh, workflow. I mean, again, another view from this source. Uh, this is somehow you need to do preparation. You need to acquire data, reformat, and clean the data. Then there are two things that you are doing, the analysis. In the analysis, you will edit the analysis scripts. You will execute the scripts, and then you get some things. You will inspect the output, and possibly you debug. You will repeat this one. And the data that you have it, you will give it to reflection. Reflection essentially means that make comparison with the thing, take the notes, hold meetings, and explore alternatives. So you have doing a different analysis. Sometimes, as I mentioned, you may need to actually change the data. But say, if this is some cycle between these two steps, between analysis and reflections, you are doing that mm -hmm. until you are happy, essentially, with the data. In this case, you disseminate the results. Write reports. Deploy online archive experiments or share data. And again, all of this can be automated. And the people are doing these are startups that currently are. Lots of them are again because of the chat GPT, because now you can describe all of this and it can understand and make into the actions. And these actions are very close to the machine language. That's essentially, uh, I think that maybe the Miracle about ChatGPT is that made all like language much closer to the machine language. In some sense, programming language were doing that, but none of them was at the level that I can describe English and it can do that or any other language. Still, you need to write formally. And all of these things that we are talking are like formal ways. And then we try to remove this formality from this. Thing. Say, no, I talk what I want. You, the machine, will go on. Uh, and of course, the danger is that at some point, then what I want is not important. Maybe some other important people think is important, or maybe at the same some time, I mean, these people may die even. So maybe their children think it's not that important anymore. So at some point, I mean, this is the danger that the machines decide what is important. And again, I think we described that it is not far from here. Even now we have it that machine decides for me. Example that I mentioned, you may not have a nice house. Why? Because a machine decides that your credit score is not good enough to get a loan for it. Well, you don't have it. Machine forces you to do that. I mean, to leave, I mean, maybe it's not the best house in China. And you cannot do anything. So you cannot change it. Well, good luck and talk with these guys. I might hear the score should be higher. Or lots of other things essentially that can happen. Uh, good. Uh, and again, if this is some maybe view about this. I mean, we are still talking with this course about the uh, data scientists spend most time. They have they have spent essentially. You get some. Uh, you get some data, you will get some data. This is called data wrangling, cleansing, merging, adopting, evaluate usability of the data, and then try to analyze that. I think 80, 90% of this is essentially going to the janitor work, which is cleaning and wrangling. But, but this is exactly the thing that the vendor is this time spent. And this is an expensive job because they give it, uh, and we discussed that, uh, mm, uh, that, I mean, they were giving essentially a lot of money to the people, data scientists. So okay, this is a lot of money involved in this. So they will come and they try to make it more automated such that they don't need to hire people to do that. This is a typical way. If you know that there is a bottleneck, you need to spend anything that can be automated. And that's the thing that I mentioned, already done with uh, uh, this kind of things like that. Uh, auto ML. Uh, like uh, Amazon, Article One, and others. Uh, uh, what are the things that are headed? I mean, this slide, I mean, essentially, was there before ChatGPT. So we have essentially, 
I mean, they have lots of tools. These tools are still relevant. I mean, some of this chat GPT, again, the people are trying to use it, that this technology that we know for the text for other things. But again, the miracle was that now I don't need to talk in the lang machine language or some formal way. I can just talk, machine can understand and make it into some action. Uh, uh, but I mean, these are the tools that have been used essentially to create this Spark, uh, Flink, uh, uh, MapReduce, etc. These are for, especially this is still very relevant uh, because uh, for distributed handling of big data. That's one of the things that is needed. So in some sense, currently in the chat GPT, all of this technology has been used. And machine learning tools uh, like uh, Scikit or R or TensorFlow, or as I mentioned, uh, PyTorch, or uh, Amazon Autogluon. And uh, cloud computing, this is like, again, it is uh, something which is interesting. And, uh, but it is, so some of this, for example, had more, I mean, the cloud computing, of course, more progress. Uh, some of this machine learning, of course, had a very lot of uh, progress, but maybe a visualization didn't have that much. I mean, still we are talking in this course, and these are something from like something like around two thousand or earlier. What are the things that I should show? Because anything that like somehow related to human maybe didn't change that much. Uh, something like containerization. That also, I mean, uh, something about more about the uh, hardware, etc. Uh, I mean, it is much easier to use complex ML techniques. In particular, we are using all ChatGPT with okay, complex ML techniques. Uh, here, this is something from uh, Matt uh, Turk. It says that uh, big data provides pipes, AI provides the smarts. And here, by AI, essentially means the ML. And maybe you can add the say that cloud provides a third leg in most cases. So you could not essentially learn on this kind of big data if cloud were not. So in some sense, yes, ML is very important. It's essentially the hard big data is it's important and the cloud. And we already discussed that like in a few slides there. So in some sense, the same fact essentially comes. These three factors become big data that we have. Uh, we have these techniques essentially better as them, and of course, we have cloud to do lots of computations. And uh, this is happening essentially uh, that lots of companies are going to the cloud, even like the companies that they spend, I don't know, 40 million, for example, three, four years ago, they decided to know we should go to the cloud. Because uh, in some sense, in the cloud things, you, you don't need to buy and update. It, uh, this, um, the life becomes more professional and more professional, even like at universities. They didn't like essentially that. wanted to say academia should be different from industry. And then we should have our mail, our own mail server, etc. We should run our, our server, etc. Yes, still run some of them, but the catch is that it becomes more and more professional. So lots of hacks happen. So in that case, then, the, then I mean, all the data that we have, it will be handled by Google because Google has the best security. I mean, you can actually read again how many attacks they are doing to Google. And they can, I mean, at least for Google, we have not heard essentially the one that uh, they lost some data. Probably they lost something, but at least not in the news. But uh, then even that's Google. I mean, like consider UMD, we don't have that technology. So everything now goes to the companies, essentially. You can't do it this professionally. The same thing here, even this idea of maintenance a computer, or a lot of computers. And that's a whole idea of cloud, because, I mean, you, you just one computer is not enough. You need to have maintenance, lots of them. And that is becoming professional. For example, these are some of the things that Microsoft, I think it was also in the news, that it's maybe a year ago or so, that they put their servers under water at the essentially bottom of a lake. Why? Because of the temperature. They can put the temperature, they can control the things there. They don't need to pay essentially, I mean, to keep them. Because this is one of the issues, I run the server and I know that if <clears throat> the weather, is, like if the uh, um, essentially the position is not good, then it becomes so hot 
then it essentially will be broken, the whole computer, easily, the server. Now they will put it underground, essentially they can have a control about the temperature, et cetera, and then they bring it, I don't know, up every six months to check anything that's happening there. This is professional. I mean, we cannot do it at the university put it under water to do that, essentially. And so that's the thing that the cloud actually become more and more relevant. And for this project, for example, you should actually, and as I mentioned, there are three types of cloud, and you should try to get familiar with all three, especially with G Cloud, which is actually advancing a lot, especially not only because of the, uh, I mean, the computers that you have it, but because of the tools that they are. And as I mentioned, they are adding more and more tools to this cloud, something that you need to use. This was another story. It was interesting. I was reading. This is something from AT uh, Airbnb public page. They are actually have a tech team. They are very professional tech company. They said that they had this uh, idea that they want to make essentially their listing more uh, somewhat informal. So what is the, uh, like? How can you do that? The people are upload figures. Now from this figure, we want to write it more informal things and so. One way that from this figure, you can see what are the amenities in the room, essentially. What are the features that is room? There are some software that they can say, it, but it was not good enough. They have tried essentially to improve it, etc. themselves. But at the end of the day, say, okay, <laughs> we improved a little, some actually good amount, but at the end of the day, we use some of these Google AI tools, and that was, I don't know, 30% better. It becomes more and more essentially sophisticated, and this is always this is a good example that I'm saying that uh, that I'm hearing. So uh, the question is that, like for example, uh, yes, you may consider that uh, architect or like an old man, his old handyman is coming and making the whole house. But maybe that's not the correct way. It might be better to have essentially lots of contractors that they work together and create this. And that would be much professional house, much better house, much better quality house. And this is the same thing happening nowadays. But the people said, okay, why should we, I mean, why university keep the Gmail? Why we should do essentially lots of the data admission system? Lots of these things nowadays are, I mean, we are doing it, but it was okay thing. The interface is not the best. The, uh, it is not updated, et cetera. So they say, okay, we should get the higher the companies. But that is the danger. Now, more and more, we are selling or sold to the machines. Because there we can say university. You can talk with the guy and say, OK, hey, uh, this email server that you have the spam is not working. This software that you have, it, can you? this is a bug. Can you fix it? Now, good luck. I mean, you will say, oh, this is a bug. Good luck to find a person who is responsible for this one. So oh, this is some company. This is not running for UMD. You are running for lots of other universities. So this is the thing you are forced to use your thing. There, there is a bug, not easy to fix. It's not the case that you will send an email that do that. You can send the feedback, but they may look at it, not, not think. So there are, of course, pros that it becomes more professional maybe it looks better, but at the same time, changing it would be hard and you become more and like, or we become more and more essentially a slave to the machines and technologies. Does it make sense? Uh, good. Uh, good. So uh, like, this is some big data landscape 2017. That's actually interesting. You can see different, it's some kind of history right now. Uh, it was interesting. I was thinking that they had a class, year one unit class that you can take history of computer science. That's what I'm interested. So you can see that 2017, but you can say history of data science. These are the companies that they have been there. Some of them are become like big companies now. Some of them are gone essentially. And this is, I mean, again, nice thing from this one. Uh, you can see, uh, I mean, some of like Oracle or others essentially becomes even more things. Amazon, maybe a small thing. Uh, Google Cloud, I mean, was there. All of them, I mean, their, their Spark was there. So, but, uh, you know, some of this, uh, probably some of these companies were bought by other companies that I don't know about. 
redis i don't know lattice uh, lots of other combines this is again something that i will provide the slides so this is nice actually it's a history of data science not that only five years ago we are not like most 15 years ago like six years ago actually uh, and what are these things uh, headed uh, uh, it's still, I mean, these are some of the issues that are uh, important. See, I mean, acquiring good data, also it is very important. Veracity, so there are like not much bias in the data. That is a still an important thing. So these are the things that, okay, given the technology, what are the important things? These are the important things. Finding good data is a still a big thing, essentially. It's no noise, with no bias, etc. The other things, essentially, interpretability, or I mean, uh, the ethics and privacy or accountability. These are some of the things, or security of the things. These are also very hot topics. Security is one of the very important things. And essentially, security and the data science, they are coupled with each other. Why do we care about security? Mainly because of the data that we have. Even somebody is still the program, at the end of the day, we want to get the data. So security and uh, data science are coupled a lot together. And that, that, I think that's one of the fields that even, as I mentioned, we have done so much changes in AI and ML. We have chat GPT, but still the battery technology is not changing that much at all. The same thing I will say for uh, this kind of security. It's still in the, like the field that has been hot, I don't know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, still it is a very hot topic. And so, some of the real-time analytics becomes more and more crucial uh, because of all this data that you will get is this, uh, this all of them essentially how you can handle it, especially using cloud. And this is the thing you don't have time nowadays to save something and use it. You need to essentially there are so much traffic that you need to handle it right there for lots of applications. Yeah. Data visualization, that's again another thing that is, again, we didn't have that much progress in data visualization. I talk about data visualization later in this course. And you will see that from 30 years, 40 years ago, I think the same type of charts we are using. Uh, data governance and security, I think that's the thing that I have mentioned. SQL is officially back. I think that is important. Lots of companies are using SQL. So if they are talking about the data science, they will ask you, they will ask about which language you want to use. You want to use SQL or you want to use Panda in Python. One of these two you need to know about. A right of data engineers, as I mentioned, this kind of security and data science is some kind of like the people who, so these are software engineers that they know data. And they, these are not the people that they know how you can write the programs, but they know how you can different aspects of data. So in some sense, you need to be software engineer and data scientist such that you can be a good, possibly data engineer. Uh, and yeah, and I think the last but not least thing is that, I mean, at the end of the day, and this is somehow the whole concept that we are talking in this class, that you need to understand, you need to have a vision. So here we'll say that the vision is very important. So vision is very important, uh, that you should understand what you are working about. Some areas are going very fast, some going slow, but of course that they are going fast, probably more money is there because the people know that there's some potential to make it something. But you need to understand, I mean, essentially, this the overall things and don't go sometimes to the details while there are some big ideas. So it is somehow is this, you need to understand quite well the whole picture. And you know that it's a very competitive market. And it is essentially hard to get uh, things done, especially if you think about a startup, etc. Much harder comp now compared to 20 years, 23 years, essentially. Not that at that time was easy, but at least nowadays, every idea that you are thinking, somebody is doing it, essentially. It's much harder. <clears throat> Good. So uh, yeah, so this is uh, uh, the things that we are uh, talking about in this course. We talk about the data science, uh, some introduction, we had it. Uh, and then uh, we will now talk about more 
few data science success stories and cautionary tales. These are some of the things that if you are not careful, actually they can data science can uh, somehow have a very bad result or if you don't use it the current knowledge correctly. Uh, so recording. Okay, so these are some of the technologies that we will uh, use here in this course. Python, uh, uh, I think this is especially interesting for Python that essentially, like good comic, I think, that you are flying oh, using Python. Now I think <laughs> probably there is a new one that is coming that this person is here, the other one is in some far a star and say, how did you go to that star is that using chat GPT? Uh, but that was the current one. But uh, yeah, we talk about Python a lot essentially. And especially uh, Anaconda. Uh, so how many of you have not installed Anaconda? Anaconda, uh, how many of you have not installed it? I think you should uh, install that, that's very important. That's actually lots of AWS, uh, Amazon AWS computer, they have actually the machine learning ones, they have already by default on, on a content. The life make the life much easier. You can do Python without Anaconda, but it's more professional. And yeah, some people, but if you're professional, you may want to do it, especially Pandas. It's very important uh, to use Panda uh, in Python and you know about it. We talk about about it, uh, Docker. Docker is very important if you want to. Uh, this is uh, like uh, we talk about the containerization essentially and Kubernetes that I have asked. If you want to deploy something, you are doing using Docker. Uh, it essentially is something that we were using there. As I mentioned, the people are using more uh, PyTorch. And again, even auto glue on, etc. You can add it. So this is a family of these guys. Uh, Jupyter Notebook, we will talk about them. Uh, that's important if you want to communicate with each other. And this is based on this idea of literate programming. And the other one is the C20. I mean, even nowadays, uh, with all this Python and uh, C, uh, I think uh, C and Python probably are the most interesting things. C computer like companies like Google, etc. The people there still are using C and these are. The main code is written sometime by C++. And now the people are going more toward Python. <clears throat> Data scientists use more Python, but if you are more software engineer, you, you need to do C++. So I think knowing this, C++ and Python probably you maximize your chances. And C++ has been updated at the time that I was working C++ maybe back in 1990, is quite different from that time. It is it's a different language. And as I mentioned, this is about in Python. Uh, one, uh, we will talk more about Python, but uh, let's go about this part, which is more interesting. So a few uh, data science success stories or cautionary tales. And you need to be careful. So the, one of the interesting thing was this uh, Nate Silver. Uh, he, uh, I mean, essentially, if you search, this is the company that he has. Uh, 538 predictions. And then it is interesting that uh, like in 2008, it could predict 49 out of 50 correctly. Uh, 2012, we could do 50 out of 50 correctly. And then he miserably failed in 2016. And if you actually see in the 2016, it is still there. So it says essentially something like 26% the chance of Trump winning the election versus, no, no, 74% chance or 73% the chance for Hillary. It was completely reversed. So it, this is important that, I mean, if you are using some data, if it is biased data, it can actually give you very bad results. Even though previously you had a good technology because you cannot do it 50 out of 50 if you don't have a nice algorithm or write things, but the data it might be completely bad. This was uh, not only that, there was another thing, for example, there are some other less famous uh, poll aggregation who have done uh, this 
2008 or 2012, essentially precisely, uh, they were even, some of them were more accurate than Nate Silver. But uh, still, you know, they failed essentially. This was an interesting thing. Uh, uh, Dr. Sam Wang, a, a polling expert who said that he will eat a bug if Donald Trump won more than 20, 240 electoral votes during the election in 2016. And then he made the promise of that. And this is it. So uh, it is a, so it is not a trivial thing. You may get some data and this data might be complete. I mean, you may, it may work before as well, but if your current data is not good, you may fail essentially miserably. Another question. Yeah. Is it that the data is wrong or that something fundamentally changed? And that day, 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 day. Yeah, so this is exactly the thing that we had in this previous case. So when you do analysis, you may go and change the, the approach. Probably approach, I mean, it wasn't reasonable, but I think the data that they got it, most probably, I mean, even if something has been changed, it means that, yeah, the data was there, but you should have done a better sampling of the data, for example. That's the thing that, uh, I mean, uh, I, I think there were some discussion here. You can read it more, essentially. Uh, like, uh, what are the reasons that, for example, something was wrong? And there are some lots of discussion about it that you can read it essentially. But next silver you search, you will find more things that what are the reasons that they are. Another thing is about ad targeting. You see, sometimes this advertisement is very important, and uh, I will add more to that. Uh, So a uh, pregnancy is the expensive and habit-forming time. Uh, this is the time that actually lots of companies uh, that they, I mean, they try to, I mean, know that there is some person pregnant, they can sell lots of stuff. In particular, uh, type uh, Target identifies 25 products and subset of there that they commonly bought by early pregnancy. And then use this history of these guys such that they target them for further advertisement for later stages of pregnancy and after that, essentially. You know that this so pregnant now said so at some point they want to buy, for example, uh, child uh, or baby shirts, you know, baby cribs, and lots of other things. The big things. Uh, and I mean, the good thing was that it was increased in terms of revenue for a uh, target. But the bad thing is that uh, it could actually expose pregnancy if you are not careful. In particular, a famously uh, a story was the one that uh, in Minneapolis, a high school uh, actually uh, got the pregnancy of that person essentially was uh, somehow exposed. And I mean, it is not hard essentially to do that. You can read the exact story, but in general, if there is a, some uh, uh, for this uh, thing to work, you know, if you are doing that, if you understand the person is pregnant, yeah. and then maybe you know, in front of father or teacher or other thing, you will show some pregnancy things. That person, I mean, notice oh, why you are seeing that if you have a basic knowledge that this advertisement is somehow based on avatar of you, then you can, I mean, if you see that, you can release this one with the other person. Uh, but you can read the exact story. But uh, uh, one thing I wanted to add also about this kind of ad targeting, this is some other thing that is very important. And this is one of the most complicated things, as I mentioned before, it's a trillion dollar business. The top companies are Google, Facebook, and uh, Amazon now. And uh, this is the ad targeting in general is one of the things that it has been under lots of essentially uh, discretions and I mean, guarantee. Why? Because I think it can reveal a lot about you. As I mentioned, these companies, Amazon, Facebook, and like Google, they have essentially a very good uh, avatar of you. Uh, that they know what you like, what are the things that you don't like, and. This is any advertisement that they are showing to you. Uh, and this is some money essentially involved that if you click on it, they get some money. 
And you can actually uh, go and uh, know more about it. This is one of the things, because it's a trillion dollar business. Uh, knowing advertisement, how does the advertisement work is very super important, especially if you want to get an interview in these top companies, which lots of them are not actually <laughs> advertisement companies. In some sense, even the whole, I mean, you may think about Amazon. Amazon, yes, I mean, there's some parts that you will see, you see it is, say, a sponsored product. Those sponsored products are advertised. But in some sense, not only that, but the whole business of Amazon, this is the main part of Amazon, is advertisement. But what they do, they generally essentially advertise for the manufacturer the things that they have. The same thing with Wayfair. Wayfair is not con considered overstock, say, for example. The, or even Home Depot, actually, at some level. These companies are, all of them are just advertisement company, just a little bit more. Essentially, this that uh, they are just advertising the items that other manufacturers are building. They are selling it. Like they fair is that they are not building themselves, they just sell it for others. So, uh, so it is, I will say, the obvious one are the advertisement, uh, the type of advertisement that we know are just like, as I mentioned, Google, Facebook, and Amazon. Amazon is just I'm talking about a sponsored product mainly. But even the whole business of these companies like Walmart, Home Depot, Wayfair, Overstock, all of them are doing advertisements. Because otherwise, if you are a company, a manufacturer, I mean, some place, it would be hard to sell your item. How do you want to sell it? You need to go for one of these companies, they will advertise for you, they get a percentage out of it, and then they sell it. So advertisement in general form is very broad, essentially. It is very important to know about it. Uh, we talk about this one in the potentials of e-commerce. Uh, I think early ones we talk about advertisement, and it is important to know that. I just briefly mentioned that uh, there are several forms of advertisement. One, which is actually, it is under, uh, especially this idea of privacy, everything it was very important for them, is the display ad. These are based on the cookies. And it, this is a typical thing that you may have seen it, that you will go, I don't know, you will search at Google for a car, and then you will go to CNN and they show the car tour. Uh, so this is the idea are based on the cookies. And what are cookies? Cookies are variables that are saved at your browser. You can, uh, if you have any essentially website, you will go there. There are two parts of it, it's the backend that it is run on their server and it's the front end. Front end is run on your computer, on your cell phone, everything. And who is the compiler this browser actually? Chrome or Firefox or others, explorers. And generally this uh, thinks the, uh, like this, uh, uh, this apps or essentially this uh, website, when they, they run, this is written in JavaScript. JavaScript, the language actually is written. And that's one of the language that you should know that. The front end, at the end of the day, would be JavaScript. Uh, you may use React or other things, but everything that the one that compiles and this guys are compiling is JavaScript. So this, very, this uh, browser actually allow you to save some variables. What are these variables? For example, you will go to Chase, your Chase Bank, this one window. Then you will open another window, and then you don't need to, you don't need to log in when you say Chase. It goes there. How does it understand that you have logged in? This is the first program that you will open in the first tab that saves a variable in your thing that you logged in. This is your ID somehow, or encryption of your ID, and your login is valid for two minutes. Then you open another one, this variable, this, again, this tab, again, run the program and say, okay, if it is written that this guy has a valid thing, don't ask for the login again. So it's very convenient. The next time you don't, you don't know, maybe you don't find this one, you go to the other one, it finds it, and then you will. But what is the bad thing is that this variable, everyone can read it. And uh, then the issue is that now you will go at the search at Google, you will do that. Google saves some of this information. Then you will go to CNN, 
again, actually, Google is running behind the scene, for example, reads those variables and says that this guy search for car. Now, show the best advertisement for this guy, which is related to car. So that's the idea of cookies, essentially. These are very important. This is very important in advertisement business. And this is lots of things you may have seen now. Nowadays, if you go to some of these websites, I think they force lots of things, especially from the uh, European Union and then later in US as well. Lots of these, they are asking, even the, some website that you have in, am I allowed to essentially, we are using cookies. They are mentioning this, that we are using the cookie technologies. Are you allowing there for your company? Always, I mean, you're forced to say yes. <laughs> you cannot do anything. Because if you say no, they may send you somewhere that you don't want essentially. But they just force you to do that. Because as I mentioned, it's a convenient thing as well. Otherwise, every time that you will go, you need to log in essentially. But uh, this was the, uh, and, but these are essentially something that you can, essentially your privacy can be exposed essentially, or can be leaked because you will go to some website, then everyone knows that you went to that website because you have saved this. And there are some kind of safe mode that's exactly the one that is doing this. This safe mode is just not allowing you to, it does not allow that these uh, cookies are saved. This variable does not allow to do safe. So then it means that if you go there, you need to log in again, but of course these variables are not. That's the meaning of safe mode. And this is important. I mean, these are some of the things that, uh, I, I mean, you may need to read a lot. I mean, it took me some time to go there and I have implemented some of this and now I understand what's going on. Otherwise, it's not that. You may hear about it, but you don't know what is that. Cookies is just some variable that they can save it on your browser. And, and this is one important thing because we are talking about ad targeting. This is, uh, this kind of uh, privacy issues is very important and uh, some companies actually went to cookie-less world. And so that was, suppose that both Apple that is running essentially the Apple iOS versus Google that has the Android, both of them are going to the cookie-less world. But uh, actually Google didn't, it was both supposed to go to this 2023 year. But I think Google still didn't go there. Apple went there actually, and that was another interesting fight between Apple and Facebook. If you heard, I think, especially a year ago. And again, why these cookies are important for advertisement? Because if this guy does not know that you went to the, if he knows that you search for a car, then he can show something that you will click on it. And each click, they get the money on. So uh, then if, if there are not uh, these cookies, for example, they, if there are cookies, maybe they are sending some relevant things that out of four advertisements, one of them you click. As soon as you click, they get some essentially uh, percentage or uh, they call it markup essentially from the, that advertisement. But if they don't know that you have seen this card, they may not need to show 10 advertisements such that you will click on one of them. It means essentially they are wasting money. And that was the whole idea that Apple versus uh, Facebook essentially fight. They had it. That Google, re uh, Apple removed this one, didn't allow that this cookie essentially be saved. And then Facebook was very upset about it. And it had an effect in their business. Now I think they could actually do it. This is something called uh, uh, this uh, differential privacy. They are using some of these techniques now. They are better essentially on that one. Uh, but it and still, but it still hurt them essentially. If you have more information, you can do it much better. Target uh, targeted advertising that they are mentioning, uh, and I will mention because this is like this. This is a very important one. We talk about the targeting, but I want to go beyond. This is a very important one. This is something that you. Lots of these companies that you will make money at the end of the day, they have some advertisement. And it was again, this I don't want to go through the details of that, but it was also interesting that why Facebook was uh, upset about Apple. He said that uh, it was the whole, I'm teaching a game theory course, and I mentioned to students that if you see the whole world as a game, you will see differently. It's a different lens. Good or bad, because sometimes if you don't understand it, you may not suffer. But if you understand it, you may suffer more. But that was the whole idea that it was interesting from Apple's side even. 
that really did that was the thing that Facebook mentioned, and it was correct. So why Apple has done it, not just necessarily, I mean, maybe they mentioned advertise it for privacy of users, they are not releasing these cookies or something like this. However, the main thing is was uh, that was the thing that especially Facebook was arguing. Not for this one, it was for the Apple's sake. Why? Because these apps that you are going there, they when they knew you and they could release this information to Facebook or something like Google, etc. From these ones, they could actually they could show some ads. Facebook or Apple, they are showing. You can actually set up such kind of things in your app, like using Google, Google AdWords, for example. You can go there and in any website you can show that it's not that easy. It takes some time to validate and you should have certain websites, etc. But they have done it myself. Then you can show ads and then you can get make money. Any ad that is showing that actually it's not that bad, even some of the ads. I got it maybe, I mean, something like $2 per click. It's a very good money. And that's a way that this app could survive, essentially. But the catch is that uh, when Apple removes these things from, you know, thing that they couldn't sh share this information about user with the Facebook or <laughs> then, then they couldn't get any money because for apps also, they need to show lots of things and they did, nobody click on that. Who was the main, uh, essentially, beneficiary of this? Apple. Why? Because these guys, then they couldn't get any money from advertisement. They need to find another source of money to sell. How could do that? Of course, these apps, all of them are providing some services for you. Everything is free because of advertisement. If there was no advertisement, nobody gives you, essentially, free stuff. So then these apps changed their model they needed to sell. You need to now buy these ones in at Apple Store. Now, anything that you will buy at Apple Store, fifteen percent, sometimes to thirty percent, goes to Apple. So that was essentially the play that they were playing. At the end of the day, this was a very in the they will sell it as oh privacy of the users, but at the end, the benefit of Apple. Anyhow, so these are interesting things, and again, I mentioned this. Of course, it is very important about advertisement. Of course, lots of these data science companies that you will see at the end of the day, as I mentioned, is some advert or some advertisement company. Essentially, this is the big things in the market is advertisement. And again, this is also another interesting thing. I think this may happen if you go to Walmart or, for example, to Home Depot. That happened to me. Yeah. So Home Depot, you will go and you see, oh, this is a company that they are selling stuff. But this. As I mentioned, they are mainly an advertisement company. Uh, the same thing for, uh, this is not much different essentially from Amazon or others. They just advertise uh, essentially uh, like the items that the manufacturer are uh, building and they are selling at their, uh, your thing. And if it was a nice story, I mean, it was the thing that happened to me. If you go actually after hours to uh, Home Depot, you may see how it's, I, at least I saw some people essentially say, okay, but are you a Home Depot store? I have a question. Say, no, we are not there. We are just from this manufacturer. They have even some particular slots that they will go and update it. Even this number of items that you will see it here. The same thing, for example, for Amazon or uh, for Walmart or other places as well. So in some sense, they are just selling some parts of their shelves to this company that they can come and then put their things. And they are responsible to come and update. So if it run out of something, they will come and update it, essentially, they will check it there. So this is very important. Uh, advertisement is a very big part of data science. And uh, knowing more about it would be very important. This is, as I mentioned, it's partly about this display advertisement, which is a big part of it. There are more to it. You can read it from this price of this potential. You can see it or watch it in the potentials of e-commerce. But uh, that's important. If you know about it, you can actually get a better uh, things out of it. Uh, good. So uh, this is uh, some other things. Again, some kind of advertisement, essentially. Again, some going there. Some of this uh, website. So these are some of the automated decisions and the consequence of that. So it happened with some of this uh, website, for example, that the people searching for minority names, when they search it, essentially, there are ads for DUI or RS records are coming, which is, of course, is very bad. 
But these are, again, these are some parts of things that I have mentioned. These type of things that we are in some sense already sold or sold to machines is like that. Is, the machine said, okay, this is like the thing just doing some statistics that of course can be wrong, very wrong for lots of people, but they are just doing that and that is bad. Or this was another thing. Female cookies, the cookies I already defined, so now I can use it, the term. Uh, that if there is some female cookie that I saved, then they want to show advertisement, they will show less professional jobs, essentially. Like that. Which is again very bad. Uh, so and this is the thing. So a lot remains. Uh, this is from the FTC commissioner. Uh, Julie Burrell, a lot remains unknown about how big data driven decision may or may not use factors that are proxies for race, sex, and other traits that US law generally prohibits from being used in a wide range of commercial decisions. What can be done to make sure these products and services and the companies that use them treat customers fairly and a very big question. And Again, these are not, uh, some of these essentially are not necessarily companies or a person is doing that. They are some algorithms or AI or machine learning. They essentially, they, as I mentioned, we discussed, these are, they only see correlation and this is the thing that they compute. And now there are uh, this area of privacy of advertisement or ethics or fairness. This is actually a very important one, how you can make sure that this does not happen essentially. And, uh, but again, this is some sort of thing that we cannot do some of this. It is shown because these machines are deciding, not us essentially. <clears throat> Another example is about uh, this uh, Netflix price. Uh, that was uh, the Netflix price one. This was uh, some recommender system essentially. You want to say the predicts a user rating for an item. So this is user one, user two, and user types of users essentially. And these are uh, anonymous data. Uh, for different uh, movies, they say plus one if they like it, minus one if they don't like it. And that's what the Netflix price said, uh, $1 million. to the first thing that beats or in-house engine by more than 10%. Actually, I was at at and and part of uh, uh, teams are saying, like actually part of the team that won this prize was from at and And I was actually talking with this. I was not part of that team, but I was talking with the people there. So it was an interesting thing. And they actually they could beat it. They could get $1 million things. And this one never used by Netflix because essentially there was various reasons. Uh, one is just too complicated or not too interpretable. And at the same time, you know, the speed is very important. Lots of these algorithms are, uh, you may compute very precise things, but precise means that you need, this is another thing that we have done, not actually at Amazon about that. This advertisement business also, if you are not careful, you do so much computation that this, a little bit margin that you will get from advertisers, that essentially would be less than the compute cost that you are paying. The same thing here is that I mean, you may do a lot, but it's just too expensive. Yes, you can beat it, but but uh, but this is what this was the again. These are some important things that I'm talking about about the data science. You cannot work on the data science and you don't know what was this Netflix price because that was a big event there essentially. Or you cannot work there and you don't know what like as I mentioned, advertisement such a big things. You don't know about. Uh, the, the war between Facebook or Apple, for example, or cookie-less world. Cookie-less world, there is no cookie. And what is a cookie, essentially? And how does the advertisement work? These are like very important things. And it takes time. I mean, these are some of them I will have been at the heart of this business, or I have written the software myself, that I know this is the detail. And that's what exactly one of the reasons that I wanted to teach this course, because I want to transfer knowledge. And this is very important because that's the thing you know that it's not, some of this, it might be hard actually to find it even the things. Because those that they know it, they not necessarily read it. This is the details. Netflix, a price too. They were supposed to be a Netflix price too, but that never happened. Why? Because in 2007, there was some, uh, UT asked in some researchers there, they could manage to denonymize 
portions of the originally released anonymized Netflix data. As a result, essentially, four Netflix users shoot Netflix and Netflix is didn't do that. So that is uh, mm -hmm. uh, also one important thing about this, about the data science. What does this tell us? Is that if you really want to do the data science, if you want to do this, you need to go to industry. Why? At academy, unfortunately, there is not much data that we have. Even some data that Netflix tried to do that, they sued Netflix. And that's the thing that is like much harder to re release the data because you say, okay, I anonymize do that, but there are some people, you're encoding them. Somebody will come decode them. And then they will come and sue. Why did you release me? I, mean, I wanted to see this type of movies. Why? <laughs> My thing is everything. And that is the unfortunate part that, I mean, you would see actually this is another interesting thing, like in the, especially machine learning and others, the biggest technology are coming from uh, this kind of uh, big tech. Essentially. There are lots of papers, but these are mainly follow-up. The main thing is come there because they have the data. There are some data you can, I mean, you can just do that, but the state of the art generally comes from this. And this is another interesting thing about data science, if you are like thinking about that, like, yeah, I can do that. In, uh, like you need to, you have a, a, another interesting thing in the value of the data. You see this thing that happened for Google that ChatGPT came and they have done much better. Google had such a technology, uh, not that much fine tune of course, but they didn't see the force to release it. Uh, because of the privacy of the, exactly one of the reasons about the privacy. Bigger companies, if you release something and this data may be leaked essentially, some of the data of the user, then you will be in big trouble. They will come and sue you because they have the money. It didn't, they didn't do that. Then they went uh, for the, uh, so then ChatGPT came. ChatGPT was a startup, didn't have not, not much money. So if you want to have a lawsuit, they, they will go for a big essentially fishes, not something that they don't have it. So they could release it, they get the things. So at the same time, uh, Google forced to take the action on those stuff uh, because it that was somehow the search business it was under question. And this was not only search business, Google actually raised this issue of that the people asking a prompt and this search engine answers. Why it was actually 2017. That was the big news there. Before it was like the case that you were searching something at Google and the Google bring the pages, like the keyboard search, we call it AdWord search. Then in 2017, they added, no, you can ask questions and Google brings the most uh, relevant things to that. And you will see that the top of the thing. They raised this question, then ChatGPT came and said, okay, this one that they are saying is just probably not the best one. And you just copy paste from one website. No, I create the whole, I uh, essentially um, innovate a solution from all the website and give it to you. That was the thing, it was very crucial for Google to do that. They forced essentially to release BART. They had some advertisement. If you heard again, this was a big story that something like Google, they had an advertisement. In the advertisement, they show that if somebody asked Bart some question about, I mean, I think what was the first telescope or something that was for the first astronaut or something like this. And the answer, that was the answer from Bart and that answer was wrong. That was actually with that 5% shares of Google went down. So it was a very crucial thing. And still Bart is, I mean, very bad. Uh, I mean, they may become better later, at least the bar, but I think they have some other things. But anyhow, for uh, Google, that was interesting that all of this happened. Still, Google could survive. Why? Because of the data. Still, ChatGPT does not have the level of data that Google has. Google has almost every aspect of life of the people have it. They have a very good avatar of everyone. So that's the thing that keep a company at the current level. So the bigger ones generally have bigger things and data is very valuable and they cannot release, even if they want in the case of Netflix, they try to do it. 
uh, the people will come and sue them because if they are leaking the information, so why should they do that as a company? And that's the thing that essentially for this type of things, this is one interesting thing is not academia is the main source here, more the big techs are the main. And even like some of this chat GPT and other stuff, even like you cannot run such kind of things, like 4 million to run this model. All of this, the thing that the people in academy or other smaller companies are doing, this data is computed by some company. How can I get more information from that? Or like prompt engineering or something like that. Anyhow, so this was again, I wanted to give the vision. That's the thing that you should understand the whole vision of the data science. And this is changes from year to year. Last year, I couldn't say all of this. Now I could yeah, explain it, this one. And you should uh, understand the whole business of this. Uh, so uh, some of these technologies that we are talking about, Python, of course, Python is uh, interpreted, means that we are, it is interpreted versus essentially not a uh, compiled thing. It is not C++. And that's the reason that it's a bit uh, actually slower, much slower than C++. Because C++, it will be executed. You can compute executed file out of it. Python, you can do it, it is much harder, but uh, you can actually do it, but in some sense you will turn it to C++ lots of the time, and then C++ will be executed. Uh, so it is dynamically typed. That's actually very convenient that verifies type safety at the runtime. You don't know what is the variable type here in Python, but in C++ you need to say the initial. Sometimes you can say auto that it understands it from that, uh, the uh, things, but still at the end it need to run before the running time. What is the type of a variable? Because then associate this amount of bytes to that. It is a, a high level abstracted away from lots of things. That's a beautiful thing about Python. That you can actually interpret lots of things very close to the language, the human language. But of course, that is maybe until ChatGPT came. Now ChatGPT, you can do lots of these things. And more and more it works essentially it can find. So I don't need to save in Python my things. I can just mention it in ChatGPT it produces. Yeah, you know, like I want to do this one in LaTeX. It was the thing. I want to draw something in LaTeX. So you cannot, uh, this is another trick actually, you can do it. Sometimes the chat GPT cannot generate images, but sometimes you can actually say, that uh, draw something for me, some chart or some slide or something, and it can produce for example in LaTeX. We give you the LaTeX code, you will go and run it and then it can create this explosion. That's another beautiful thing. I mean, this, I will call it creature, I don't call it a software. It's like any time that I work with that, I will find some new things, new characters. Capabilities and these are some of them are excellent in both capabilities. Not everything, but uh, it is garbage collected. I mean, it is like it is doing the memory management for you, and it is uh, it is object oriented and essentially functional language as well. It's a complicated actually language Python, especially if you want to do it at the professional level. Is some of these wrappers and other things that I mean we don't talk here, but you can learn about it. It takes a lot of time. I expect a lot of things myself even to understand it because it's fine. This functional programming at some level actually is complicated. Yes, you can do some simple stuff with Python and that's easy. But if you want to do complicated, reading these programs in Python can be very complicated. Uh, uh, so Python is fast. In terms of developer time, generally, because you can do a lot there. It is intuitive at some level, not for everything. And it is used in the industry. So a very important thing, and that would be the main thing here. C++ would be essentially another one that you can use it for some of this. We talk even about binding of these two languages, Python and C++. Uh, this is, uh, this is another thing, uh, uh, Jupyter Net, um, Jupyter Notebook, essentially. That's based on the, it is literate programming of Donald. He mentioned the literate code is the one, one document that contains the source code. Of course, that all the, should have the source code. Then explanation of the code, you can put the comments and explain how do I do that, and the end results of the running the code. And that's essentially this basic idea. It went to a Jupyter uh, Notebook, and lots of companies are using it. Uh, especially for sharing between different people is very useful. And lots of top companies, like for example, like Amazon, it was a typical thing that everyone's using that. Or for example, or like these are the things that they are doing that. If you want to just, generally, if you want to bring, you need to bring a server to 
run it essentially. But an easier way is to just use Google Google Colab. If you everyone, if you Google Gmail account, you have it. You will search Colab. Uh, I think maybe Colab. Uh, research uh, um, or research. Colab. Uh, Google, but search essentially Colab. Google, you will find. Uh, then you will go, you have accounts there and you can actually, the one that you are writing is actually this. So you don't need to, if you want to do Python, if you want to use this, uh, Jupyter Network, you don't need to even install anything. You will just go to Google Colab and you can do that. If you want to do heavy data or such, uh, you have a limited things. But other than that, you can do lots of things actually in the Google Colab. And, uh, and they are essentially... Uh, uh, this is something which is uh, very good on that thing. Uh, there are this uh, Jupyter project, essentially. This is also based on this kind of interactive Python, IPython. It's a web-based thing that is now currently used more than 40 languages and can be shared easily and can be also, if you want to use a Spark or other, it's very easy actually to use it. Uh, there are some other things like, for example, uh, RS, uh, RS Studio. Uh, and another one is like more recently is VS Code. VS Code is like, again, used a lot. It was not like that a few years ago, but now it has been used a lot because you can do lots of things. You can essentially add some, and even like some version of ChatGPT is there, some, some version of uh, this, uh, uh, like uh, LaTeX is there. Anything that you will think about is there essentially. You can add on and use it essentially. Uh, so VS Code is the one that we are using. Uh, you can use it. I'm using it essentially for lots of things. Again, everything goes in the same thing. Uh, this is I also use, for example, a spider. How many of you use a spider? Spider is a good one. If you want to actually, if you write, for example, if you have written C++ before and you want to write something in Python, then you will. I use a spider. It's a fast one comparing to the other things, and uh, it's a. I mean, a good one. I, not all people. I don't like personally that much uh, notebook because, uh, like Jupyter notebook, because it's not that much of a like programming language. It's more like play that you are doing in some sort. It's not. I mean, it's not a clean code that I like it. But anyhow, some. I mean, the, some companies essentially are using it that you need to know about it anyhow, even if you don't like it. Uh, good. Uh, Python versus R, I mean, you should know Python. I mean, Python, yeah, R actually for something for stats was very good. They had the libraries. But nowadays, everything that exists for any language also exists, some packages for Python as well. So you just need to know the right package. You can do anything. Uh, especially for ML nowadays, I mean, are not using. So Python is the main thing to know that. And so, uh, I mean, some uh, wrap up so far. So we had, you are essentially in the this data science master program or ML program. So here we uh, talk about some of the topics in from different angles, from diff essentially boards of different people. Uh, I think you should know about Python uh, notebooks or VS Code and or really familiarize yourself with Python. That is important. How many of you have used VS Code? Okay, so that's essentially it that shows that. Again, this, for example, previously it was not like that. This, everything is dynamic here, like from here to here. You are in an airplane that goes very fast at speed, especially in the data science field, not at all on the like battery, like you know, battery industry. It is the same slow machine that is going for a long. Like still I have the same problem with battery of my laptop that I had it, I don't know, 15 years ago. Not much change in uh, Yeah. And if you're interested, how many of you know C++? Yeah, so that is good, actually. This is, I think it is good to know both of them because the speed is something that is very important. And sometimes, uh, not everything, Python is general things is better, but some functions you want to do it to do it faster, you may do it actually with C++. It can be like sometimes 50 times faster than quicker in some of these things. And then you should know about binding such that you can bind these two languages together. Some function, essentially the whole idea of Python is based on binding, that it is written in C++, lots of these things, and we will talk about NumPy or Pandas. All of them are based on written by C++. And then you bind it essentially, and then you are using it. You can add to this, and then it would be very uh, helpful. 
Uh, I think uh, that's it uh, for uh, this session and we are in stopping here. <laughs>